Now, today we, we uh, gather as Republicans, Americans, and, uh, and friends of Israel. For the last three years, we've had a lot of change. We just haven't had much hope. <laughs> I happen to... <laughs> I happen to think to have a president that can create jobs that helps to have had one. Our debt is now too high, and our opportunities are too few. Almost a trillion dollars in failed stimulus and trillions more in deficits have left millions of Americans out of work. The unemployment rate, as you know, has been over 8 percent for the last 34 months. This is the slowest recovery since Hoover. Over the last four years, the median income in this country has dropped by 10 percent, even as the cost of food and Clothing and uh, health care, gasoline, all those have gone up. Now, now, the poor have a safety net, and the rich are doing just fine. But middle-income Americans have never seen things so bad. Internationally, we've, uh, we've witnessed uh, a weakening of our military and a decline of our standing in the world. President Obama's troop withdrawals in Iraq and Afghanistan were quite apparently based upon electoral expediency, not military requirement. And then he's bowed to foreign dictators. And when the opportunity arose to defend freedom, he's either been late to the game or failed to show up at all. He rushed to apologize for America, but he's hesitated to speak up for democracy and freedom. He visited Egypt, Syria, no, not Syria, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Turkey, he even offered to meet with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Yet in three years in office, he hasn't found the time or interest to visit Israel, our ally, our friend, a sole Middle East nation that fully shares our values. The nation, in President Truman's words, that's an embodiment of our great ideals of this civilization. No, over the last three years, President Obama has instead chastened Israel. In his inaugural address to the United Nations, the president chastised Israel, but had almost nothing to say about Hamas launching thousands of rockets into Israel's skies. He's publicly proposed that Israel adopt indefensible borders. He's insulted Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, and he's been timid and weak in the face of the existential threat that Iran faces excuse me, that Israel faces from Iran. These actions have emboldened Palestinian hardliners, and they're now poised to form a unity government with terrorist Hamas, and they feel they can bypass Israel at the bargaining table. President Obama has immeasurably set back the prospect of peace in the Middle East. Now, as president, my policies could not be more different. I will travel to Israel on my first foreign trip. I will reaffirm as a vital national interest Israel's existence as a Jewish state. And I want the world to know that the bonds that exist between Israel and the United States are unshakable. I want every country in the region that harbors aggressive designs against Israel to understand that their ambition is futile and that pursuing it will cost them very dearly. I would not meet with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. He should be excluded from diplomatic society. In fact, he should be indicted for the crime of incitement to genocide under Article 3 of the Genocide Convention. And on my watch, Iran's ayatollahs will not be permitted to obtain nuclear weapons. A nuclear-armed Iran is not only a threat to Israel, 
It's a threat to the entire world. Our friends must never fear that we will not stand by them in an hour of need. And our enemies should never doubt our resolve. Now today, you've already heard from one and perhaps you can hear from all the Republican contenders for president. Uh, like me, my guess is that each will acknowledge President Obama's failings. It's a long list, so we have a lot of material. Um, we'll describe his failings towards Israel. And like me, each will assure you of the friendship and commitment we have to that nation. We're not distinguished from one another by our opposition to President Obama or even by our support for Israel. What distinguishes us is our experience, our perspective, and our judgment. I spent 25 years, as Sam Fox indicated, in business. I've signed the front and the back of a paycheck. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I've helped businesses like the Sports Authority and, and Staples to grow from startups to international enterprises. I've served as a governor of a state and as the steward of an Olympics. My perspective is informed by those experiences and, of course, by the defining constants in my life, my 42-year marriage to my wife, Anne. The, The, uh, the life that we built with our five sons, sons five daughters-in-law, and 16 grandkids. And uh, <laughs> and of course, the faith that uh, sustains us. My family, my faith, freedom. These are enduring truths in my life. My commitments are firm. They don't falter. When I was young, I had the opportunity to, to live abroad for a couple of years. And I came to recognize that the greatest advantage my parents had given me was letting me be born in the United States of America. I am passionate about the principles that have made this nation the land of opportunity and a shining city on a hill. I believe in America. I believe it is the greatest nation in the history of the earth I believe that the next century must be an American century. Our, I believe our highest priority must be to maintain a people, an economy, and a military so strong that no one would ever, ever risk challenging it. My, my faith in America stems both from my faith in the American people and from the principles that have made those people strong. We're a people from all parts of the world, all walks of life, but we're strengthened by our nation's unique founding principles. It's not by accident or luck that America became the greatest nation in the world. It is by virtue of the power of our values and beliefs and principles. We weathered the Great Depression. We emerged victorious from two world wars. We faced down the evil empire. And today, as we face new threats, I have every conviction that the American people, edified by American principles, will rise to the occasion again, securing our safety, our prosperity, and our peace. Now, one of those principles that I want to spend a moment talking about today is the fact that we are a merit-based society. In a In a merit-based society, people achieve success and rewards through hard work, education, risk-taking, and sometimes a little luck. The founders considered this principle to be one endowed to us by our Creator, and they called it the pursuit of happiness. We call it opportunity, or we call it the freedom to choose our course in life. A merit-based opportunity society is one that gathers and creates a citizenry of pioneers, of people who invent, who build, who create. And then as these people exert the effort and take the risks inherent in inventing and creating things, they employ and lift the rest of us, creating prosperity for all of us. The rewards they earn don't make the rest of us poorer. 
They make us all better off. American prosperity is fully dependent upon having an opportunity society. I don't think President Obama understands that. I don't think he understands. I don't think he understands why our economy is the most successful in the world. I don't think he understands America. He, he is a. He, he is seeking to replace our merit based society with an entitlement society. And in an entitlement society, everyone re receives about the same rewards, regardless of the education they pursue, regardless of their effort, regardless of the willingness that they have to take risk. And that which is earned by some is redistributed to others. And in that kind of setting, by the way, the only people who get truly disproportionate rewards are the people who do the re redistributing, the government folks. Entitlement societies are, of course, praised in academic circles, where, where they're far removed from the reality of a competitive world. Uh, you see, they replace opportunity with certainty, certainty that everyone in the entitlement society will enjoy nearly the same rewards. But there's another certainty. They'll all be poor. Because... Because in an entitlement society, the, uh, the invigorating pursuit of happiness is replaced by the deadening reality that there's no prospect of a better tomorrow. Risk-taking disappears, innovation disappears, small businesses disappear, and they're replaced by a large government bureaucracy and government enterprises. And the result, as we've seen throughout history, is a nation that stagnates, that declines, and that can't defend itself. I'm convinced that this is where President Obama's fundamental change is leading America. And it informs aspects of his foreign policy as well. Think about this. Internationally, President Obama has adopted an appeasement strategy. Appeasement betrays a lack of faith in America, in American strength, and in America's future. Like others among the Washington elite, he believes that America's role as the leader of the world is a thing of the past, that this is going to be a post-American century, perhaps an Asian century. American strength, he imagines, will eventually be entirely or partially eclipsed. And so he seeks to appease those he believes will balance us or who might challenge our leadership in the future. This appeasement by this administration has taken a lot of different forms over the last three years. It includes offers to engage with the world's most despicable dictators. It consists of concessions to Russia to remove our missile defense sites from Poland, also to exclude tactical nuclear weapons from the new um, remarkably one-sided New START treaty. President Obama even looks the other way as China employs obviously unfair trade tactics that endanger our, our economy and kill jobs. He, he seems to be more generous to our enemies than he is to our friends. And that is the natural tendency of someone who is unsure of their own strength or of America's rightful place as the leader of the world. <laughs> the, the, uh, the course of appeasement has long been the path chosen by the weak and the timid. And history shows it's a path that a nation chooses at its own peril. The president promised that he would fundamentally change America, and he's doing it. At home, he's changing us from an opportunity nation to an entitlement nation. He's building a government so large that feeding it consumes a greater and greater share of the people's production. And it's a government so intrusive that it can command free enterprise and free people according to the will of its bureaucracy. And abroad, he's weakening America, shrinking our military, shrinking from our commitments to our friends, accommodating our foes, and appeasing the competing forces that are vying for global leadership. 
This election is not only a referendum on President Obama's failures on employment, on income growth, on housing, on the recovery, or even on a nuclear intent Iran and emboldened China, or on friends like Israel being put at greater risk. This election will decide what kind of America we will have. It is a defining election. Will we remain an opportunity nation or become an entitlement nation? Will we remain the leader of the free world or become a follower in a more dangerous world? Will America be transformed by Barack Obama? Or will America be restored with the founding principles that have made this nation the greatest one the, nation, the world has ever seen? Many think that because of his staggering failures, President Obama will be easily defeated. But as you know, an incumbent is rarely turned out of the White House, and he will resort to anything. As you know, class warfare and demagoguery are powerful political weapons. In less than a year, Americans will be asked to make a choice about the kind of country they want to live in and the kind of future they will bequeath to their children. It will be a choice between entitlement and merit, between appeasement and resolve. Our party must offer a candidate who can make the case for freedom, opportunity, and strength. Our nominee must offer Americans more than just a choice to vote against President Obama. Our nominee must give Americans an opportunity to vote for a different path and a better future, a path dictated not by government but determined by a free people, a path marked by the virtues of merit, not by the slow decline of entitlement, a path that achieves prosperity through opportunity and peace through strength. This is what Americans deserve. This is what the moment demands. And this is what I will deliver with your help. Join me. Join me. And I will lead our party and our nation through these difficult times to a brighter future. America has been a shining city on a hill. But that light is dimming. But together, we will reignite the spirit of American greatness. We've wandered. We've drifted. I will lead us to a better place. Join me, and together we will reclaim and rebuild the America we love. I believe in America. Our fight starts today. Join me. Together we're going to win. God bless this great nation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me turn to some questions that you may have on, on this or other matters of interest. This is a... Uh, this is quite a gathering, so I expect, uh, please. Oh, there's a, already a line there at the question. All right, please. It's great to be popular, Governor. Thank you. Um, my name is Richard Thames. I'm from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Uh, my friends and I are mostly conservatives, and our concern has always been that the governmental class in this country is made up of both Republicans and Democrats. And whether it's banning a stupid light bulb, which the Republicans did, or running amok like the people next door in the EPA are doing now, what we are looking for is a leader who will absolutely change the regulatory, governmental, and in insane environment we live in today, caused by both parties. Tell me how you're going to do that. Um, the, the answer is leadership. All right, but there, there, you all have been involved in various enterprises of one kind or another. One of the things that's most remarkable to me is the impact of a leader. And I, and I have seen... Um, I mean, we've all watched what happened when Ronald Reagan came into office. Is, is it not amazing that one person, by virtue of his capacity to lead, wasn't a technocrat, wasn't a legislator, wasn't a bureaucrat, he was a leader, by his capacity to lead and bring people together 
and to inspire people on both sides of the aisle to do what was in the best interest of their nation, not necessarily in their best interest as politicians. He was able to get Congress to move, and most importantly, he was able to get the evil empire to change. Leadership. Now, I, I, uh, I, I'm not a perfect guy by any means, and I've made mistakes. But one thing I have learned through my life is something about leadership. My mom and dad were leaders. My dad was a leader. I aspire to have the leadership capacity of my dad. Some of you remember George Romney. Remarkable man. I, I, I was lucky enough to be the youngest of the four kids. And the, my brothers and sisters had left the house, so they sort of took me around with them everywhere they, they went. I got to watch my dad lead at American Motors. I got to see him run for political office, governor, three times. I, I witnessed seeing a leader as a boy, and then I became a leader myself and, and did so. I led four enterprises. And the test of a leader, by the way, is not just what job they get, because you can get jobs lots of different ways. They can be given to you as a payback. They can be uh, uh, earned through a vote of popularity. The question is, when you get leadership, what do you do with it? And in the enterprises I led, I turned around one that was in trouble. I built a startup from the ground to now an internationally acclaimed uh, firm. I got to the Olympics when it was in trouble and turned in the most successful Winter Olympics in history. And in Massachusetts, which is a very red state, as you know, we were able to balance the budget. Uh, uh, every year I was in office, put in place a rainy day fund of $2 billion and eliminated a $3 billion budget deficit in our first year. The, 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 and I can go on, my list of fun things in Massachusetts was great. We drove our schools to be number one in the nation. Uh, the, uh, when, when I came into office, there was an effort to try and remove the graduation requirement of passing an exam to graduate from high school. I stood up for that requirement. Our, uh, our kids are doing well. I, I, I can tell you this, the best, the best uh, hope you have that I will be able to change Washington is that, number one, I've had the experience of leadership, and number two, I'm not a creature of Washington. I'm a creature of the private sector. I'm a business guy. I, I, I'm not in this because I want the next step in my political career. I don't have a political career. I, I'm in this because I care about America. And I'm convinced. <laughs> and, I, and I'm convinced the path we're on is the path towards Italy, towards Greece, towards Ireland, towards Iceland. That's the path we're on. And unless we get this thing turned around and quick, we will not only suffer now, and our kids will suffer, but the world will suffer. I was in Great Britain. One of the leaders said to me, Mitt, you're going to be criticized. America will be if you become president. You'll notice as you go from country to country. But don't ever forget this. What we all fear the most is a weak America. American strength is the best ally peace has ever known. And I will keep America strong. Thank you. Over here. Mike Lax from New Jersey. Uh, I first wanted to thank you. I don't think there's another national Republican leader who has spent more time trying to help the New Jersey Republican Party than you. Thank you, thank you. And, and certainly I think you own a piece of Chris Christie making that happen and helping to save our state. He's kind of helping me too, I gotta, I gotta acknowledge, yeah. Uh, my question is, you know, in New Jersey where, you know, our governor is constantly fighting the Democratic majority uh, in the Assembly and the State Senate, getting anything done is very difficult. What can you do in the first six months of your presidency to help our economy and kind of bypass specific things that can be done to help the economy and bypass Congress and, and the Democrats who just, just want to argue and, and get no progress? Well, there are a bunch of things a president does where he or she does not need Congress. And, and those things I'll do immediately. Actually, on day one, I got a bunch of things that I'm going to do. One, I'm going to, I'm going to put a halt on all regulations that were installed during the Obama years, all of them. And, and be, because these regulatory agencies are, are filled with people who don't like you very much, who, who, who don't like private, the private sector and private enterprise and business people. And so I'll look through those. We'll evaluate which ones are killing jobs and hurting the economy. Because there are people who feel the job of government is to hold down the free, the free enterprise and, 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 the pub, and the private sector. I believe the job of bureaucrats is to try and encourage our economy and make us more competitive. So that's one. I, I will also direct the Secretary of, of Energy to provide licenses to the drilling companies that want to start getting more oil and gas out of our own resources. I, 
I will also issue an executive order that says no longer do you have to use unions on federal government projects, building roads and so forth. Make it competitive. It, the, the, li the list goes on and on. That's just a, a, a sample of the kinds of things a president can do. I'm also going to immediately reduce the, the number of, of federal employees. Uh, that's something I could do directly. We'll dramatically cut back. And then something that needs legislative help I would, or, or approval, I would, I'm intent on linking the pay of government workers with the pay that exists in the private sector. And then, and then we have to go to work on some things that are a little tougher. One, I will grant a waiver from Obamacare to all 50 states. And uh, can you see all the things that a president gets to do if, if, he cares about, if he cares about conservative principles? Some things like Obamacare, I, we're going to also need to get it repealed to get rid of all of its elements. Uh, so if, if, you, if you give us a... Uh, if you give us a Republican House and a Republican Senate and a Republican president, we will get America right again such that it remains strong. Thank you. Daniel Pipes, Pennsylvania. In 1981, we had a problem with Iran. And as the very moment as Ronald Reagan was being sworn in, 444 days of hostage taking came to an end and the 52 hostages were released. Is there anything you can do that on January 20th, 2013, we won't have a problem with Iranian building, the Iranians building a nuclear weapon so that they will understand that this is unacceptable to us now as holding the hostages was 32 years ago. Yeah, uh, let me tell you what, what I would do. Uh, I don't know how far along we'll be by the, the, the date of January 20th of, of 2013 and where they will be at that stage or what may have happened before that occurs. I, I, I was at the uh, Herzliya conference in, uh, in Tel Aviv, I think it was four or five years ago and I laid out the seven steps I thought we had to take to dissuade Iran from their nuclear folly. None of those steps have been pursued, which is terribly disappointing and has consequence of enormous import. Um, just mentioning a few. One, of course, we keep talking about crippling sanctions. We just don't do it. I, I think one of the greatest foreign policy failures of this president was that when he decided to give Russia their number one foreign policy objective, which they fought for for 10 years, which was removal of their missile defense sites from Poland, he gave them that and did not get in return a commitment by them to back crippling sanctions against Iran. That was an outrage. But, that's, but, but that effort should not stop. Number two, we should treat the Iranian diplomats, business people, and leaders like the pariah they are as long as they're pursuing <laughs> nuclear weaponry. And that includes indicting Ahmadinejad, as I indicated. We should also have covert and overt activities to encourage voices of dissent within the country. Ultimately, regime change is what's going to be necessary in, uh, in that setting. And, uh, and we should make it very clear that we are developing and have developed military options. Nothing concentrates the mind like suffering from sanctions and seeing a military option. It is unac unacceptable. We keep using that word. It is unacceptable for the United States of America to endure an Iran with a nuclear weapon. Iran nuclear means Egypt nuclear, Saudi Arabia nuclear, Syria nuclear, Turkey nuclear. It means a world that is not safe for Israel, is not safe for Europe, is not safe for America. That is not something we can, we can allow to occur. Thank you. Quick. You're pulling me away. I get one more. Make it, I'll make it very quick. First of all, we have had a president who has gone around the world apologizing for the United States. I hope if you were the president, you will go around the world apologizing for Obama. <laughs> All right. I, now I, now I, to my question. Oh, that, um, <laughs> that was a good. You, you remember the George Costanza line: "When they're laughing and applauding, you sit down." That's. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have been a terrific lifelong Republican, by the way, and I want to let you know some of us appreciate that. Uh, Eric Holder, Attorney General of the United States, has sent false information to the Congress regarding fast and furious gun running to Mexico. He ignored black, new Black Panther voter suppression in Philadelphia. Uh, we have a, he has, so far, I haven't seen investigations on Solyndra. 
and the crony capitalism corruption going on with those loans. Hillary Clinton has ignored our brothers and sisters, Coptic Christians in Egypt, and she has the chutzpah, this audience will understand. E even I, even I, even I get chutzpah. <laughs> yeah. To say to Israel, your orthodox women aren't being properly uh, tended to by the government. Uh, would you consider, if you are our nominee, nominating ahead of the election somebody like a Rudy Giuliani to take on Eric Holder as the Attorney General? <laughs> yep. What? Perhaps consider nominating ahead of time someone to be Secretary of State to take on Hillary Clinton and allow the American public to see the kind of nominees you would have to go after these secondary positions, which are very important. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, an the answer is yes. Uh, I, I, can, I, can tell you, I, I can't give you any names, uh, of course, but I can tell you, I was just in New York this week, and uh, as we drove around the city, uh, the people I was with remarked what a remarkable city New York has become thanks to Rudy Giuliani. There is, there is, uh, uh, you know, every, every time uh, the sophists uh, draw you towards weakness and accommodation and appeasement, uh, you see on occasion a person of strength that stands for principles, and when that occurs, you see the positive outcome. You see it in New York City. Uh, you see the, the, the opposite effect of that uh, as, as we look at, a world, at, at world affairs today. Strength, American strength is the best ally peace has ever known. I will be, if I'm fortunate enough to become president, I will be a president that focuses every aspect of foreign policy upon whether or not it makes America stronger. And making America stronger, America stronger, means linking arms with your allies. And if you disagree with them, do so in private. In public, show the world we are united, because united, we're strong. Thank you so much. Great to be with you.